Good morning, United. Some people say they can breathe. I hope all of you are breathing and you take a moment right now to breathe and to be present with us in this moment. We are reading from the gospel today, the gospel of Mark, and we are in chapter one, verses 14 through 20. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. Dear Lord, scientists say that oftentimes we're not breathing or we're not breathing correctly. And so, Lord, help us to breathe and to trust and to rest in you. We ask that you open our understanding, our ability to learn, our ability to change, our ability to accept new information, access. Open all of that up to us right now as we breathe new life and we breathe this holy space and moment. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been on a worship series called Finding Our Way, and just reminding ourselves about what are some of the basics of Christianity. Sometimes we can get so far away from the point of where we began, and so just gently reminding our community of what our faith is all about. Today, in part four, the sermonic theme for today is personal invitations, personal invitations. Jatrice spoke at the Wild Goose Festival. In her career life, she's an executive VP of external affairs of Volunteers of America. But two years ago at a Wild Goose Festival, she spoke to a diverse community about the importance of diversity in our world. While she was talking to this community, she shared a, a part of her own story, a part of her own life. Being a child of a military parent, she attended school in, journey, in Germany. And at the time she attended school, which was a couple of decades ago, she recalls being the only African-American child in her class. But what she remembers more vividly than that is in the third grade, one of her classmates had a birthday party and everyone in the classroom got invited except for her. She remembers one classmate, Michael, standing up for her and saying, she's clean, why can't she come? She remembered him as the one person that spoke up for her and spoke on her behalf. She remembers how adults tried to say, oh, it's no big deal, it's just one birthday party. But what she has never shaken is the absence of an invitation. I want to talk about personal invitations today. Personal invitations are important. It means something when a person thinks enough of us to invite us to something. Did you know the number one reason that people come to church for the first time, according to the Barna Research Group, is because they get a personal invitation? Yeah, there's a host of other reasons why people might come to church, but 47% of those polled said they come to church or are likely to consider coming to church because someone invited them 
to come to church with him. It's clearly the number one reason why new people might come to church at all. Even in our technologically savvy world where we can Zoom and we can send texts within seconds, it's still that personal invitation that means something to people. This week, along with many of you that are watching today, I watched the inauguration. I started a little bit late, but I'm so grateful to YouTube for helping me to catch up. Wasn't that a lineup? Senator Amy Klablucher, I'm not sure I'm saying her name right, but I tried. <laughs> Senator Amy Kablucher gave the welcome. She was the beginning of the program. Lady Gaga delivered on the singing of the national anthem. And Justice Sonia Sotomayor administering oath of office to the vice president. And I loved, I loved, loved, loved Jennifer Lopez's rendition of America the Beautiful. This land was made for you and me. This land, this land, this land was made for you and me. Una nación bajo de Dios con libertad e justicia para todos. This land was made for you and me. Chief Justice John Roberts Jr. administering the presidential oath of office. Garth Brooks giving us a country rendition of Amazing Grace, inviting us all to sing the song together at home. Amanda Gordon, Amanda Gorman, the sixth poet to perform at a presidential inauguration, leaving us with the soul-stirring poem, The Hill We Climb. And the closing was given by a longtime friend of Joe Biden's, Reverend Beeman. Each person on the program was there by personal invitation. I imagine that each participant will never forget. I started remembering former inaugurations like Aretha Franklin and other people, Maya, but each of those people that received a personal invitation will never forget that they were personally invited to perform for the inauguration of the 46th president. This is where we enter the biblical text today. Jesus approached certain individuals and invited them to be disciples. In this passage, he approaches brothers Simon and Andrew, and then he walks a little bit further and he approaches brothers James and John. I don't know what it was with the brothers on this particular day. Perhaps he saw something in them. Perhaps he saw humbleness. Perhaps he saw a hard work ethic. They were out on boats trying to catch fish. Perhaps he saw integrity as they were working with their father. Perhaps he wanted to build on something that he saw already present in him. Perhaps it wasn't what he saw in them. Perhaps it's what he didn't see in them. There's no arrogance there, no full of self there. Maybe Jesus saw people who he could work with. He knew that in order to have any real presence in future, because he wasn't going to be around for long, that he needed to personally invite others to be a part of this Jesus movement. And so he wasn't vague or unclear about his intent and his purpose on earth. He eagerly reached out to the 12 and they set up camp. But they were not the only ones that Jesus reached out to. The Jesus of the gospel was intentional and specific, and he would go up to people and engage them. And so in finding our way, this fourth part of our worship series, going back to the basics of our faith, we are gently nudged, reminded of another key that is basic to our faith. That's evangelism. Jesus invites the disciples as a model for us to the importance of reaching out to others and inviting people to a relationship with God, to community, to conversation, to discipleship. In the life of the church, we have discovered you can put things in a bulletin, you can send out emails, you can make it public, you can put it on repeat and do it four weeks in a row, but there's something about personal invitation that is different and more personal that solicits a response from people. 
Could it be that we're bombarded by marketing? Could it be that we're bombarded by requests? Could it be that we're bombarded by emails? Could it be that we're bombarded by demands? We are bombarded by bills. Some of y'all bill collectors. We're bombarded by life. But when someone uses the old-fashioned method of reaching out to us personally, that still trumps all other forms of speedy communication. I think personal invitation, personal anything matters. And Jesus, if he was anything, Jesus was personal. This notion of inviting people to a relationship with God or inviting people to our church when it opens back up someday has been a little bit challenging for our community. It's been challenging to move beyond the comfort zone of the path we're traveling. It's been challenging to put ourselves out there on the lawn, in the community, in the world. I'm not talking about standing on State Street with a boom box and telling people they're going to hell if they don't give their life to Jesus. But I am talking about extending ourselves to invite people. We're learning here today that invitations are powerful. Jesus walked up to James and John and the other two brothers and spoke with an authority. He was known, but he wasn't that known, and yet he had a certain backbone and confidence to his invitation. I'm kind of chuckled because he really didn't ask a question. He just told him to come on. You see, the way we invite folks makes all the difference in the world. If we lack confidence, we don't believe, that invitation seems weak. Have you ever had someone say, oh, come on over, and you can sense they don't really mean it. Jesus knew why he was inviting these brothers. He knew why he was inviting them to fish for people. Y'all been fishing for fish? Hey, I got one for you. Let's go fish for people. Somebody is waiting for your invitation. Somebody is waiting for you to personally invite them. A few years back, I heard Elizabeth Lesser do a TED Talk. How many of you like TED Talks? She says she always felt torn between being a warrior and a mystic. This balancing made her a follower of many people, but three people she mentions is MLK Jr., Mother Teresa, and Nelson Mandela. These words resonate with her. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. You know that? Martin Luther King Jr. The problem of the world is we draw the circle of family too small. Mother Teresa. And last, I need you to be me. You need me to be you. Ubuntu by Nelson Mandela. She thinks the work in our world requires personal invitation. We invite people to this work. She launched an initiative of extending a personal invitation to people that were different from her to have lunch with them. So for example, she's kind of liberal, so she invited someone conservative to have a meal with her. And there were a few grand rules like we're not gonna defend our positions, we're not gonna attack each other's beliefs. But the goal was to share a meal and learn more about one another. Two people gathered, dropping their weapons and reaching towards one another. And this lunch was a real game changer for her and this person she gathered with because they found that in having a lunch together that how the other described the other was not who they were at all. That those words that were used to describe the other position was not who they saw before them. Personal invitations are powerful. What would have happened if Jesus had never invited the disciples to follow him? Would this movement have continued? Who would have shared the good news with the next generation? And since they are gone, who's going to do it now? Personal invitations are central to our faith. 
There's somebody waiting on your invitation. There are people who need you to be willing to risk your comfort to extend an invitation. If you look, Jesus got rejected plenty of times, but he never lost sight of his goal to share the good news. The woman at the well tried to front him, but Jesus wasn't bothered at all. He just kept it real. And he wasn't afraid of rejection because he knew his purpose. Today, I began with a story about someone who was the only one in her class that didn't get invited, that didn't get a personal invitation to the birthday party. I'm sure many of us can think of a time when we didn't get invited because feeling left out is universal. Amen. Some have built mountains on it and can't get over it, and others, it's just a memory. It happened. But today, I invite you to a different space, and that's the space of being in the driver's seat. I'm extending a personal invitation to you. It sits at the seat of our faith. There's someone that's out there that's waiting for your invitation. You can appeal to their stomach or their heart or their sensibilities. Or you can appeal to the God in them. Do something that could radically shift or forever change someone's life. Extend a personal invitation. Jesus is not the only one inviting people to fish, inviting the disciples to fish for people, but by proxy, by choice, by those being our ancestral siblings, we too are invited to fish for people. I would like to say it differently. There's a field of people out there, and you are personally invited to meet others there. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, one of the basics of our faith is making disciples. One of the basics of our faith is inviting people to relationships. And sometimes that may seem a little hokey dokey, but it is your text and it is your word. And there are people who need to hear good news. There are people in our world that need to be invited. There are people that need a touch from you. And Lord, you've called us to this space, all of us, to be disciples. So Lord, may we go forth in authority and confidence. May you touch and prick our heart that what you've called us to do is so important. Sometimes we can think other things are important, but touching another human being's life is important. Extending kindness is important. Letting someone know that they're thought of in the invitation is important. Because all of that is fishing for people. Amen. <laughs>